talking as an ex-political strategist who no doubt played his part in designing campaigns. No, no <laughs> risk. A capital N. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, all, all I'm saying now, however, is that as I think people... As an impartial people, bystander. I think as yeah. an impartial bystander, yeah. I think the general public are absolutely fed to the back teeth with seeing the sort of jeering and jousting, the sort of PMQs on stilts put on television. I think it will turn them off in droves. I don't think you'll reach the end of the campaign and anyone will be any the wiser about what the real challenges and problems are facing our country and what the competing approaches are to resolving them and facing up to them. Here we are again then. How to win an election. Your insider's guide to the huge political year ahead. I'm Matt Chorley, joined in the studio by new Labour mastermind Peter Mandelson and Tory brain box Daniel Finkelstein and beaming in live, Polly McKenzie, Policy McKenzie, former Director of Policy for Nick Clegg. Hello, Polly. Hello, Matt. Where are you in the world, Polly? I'm at Windsor Castle. Oh! You know. Oh, you can tell by the tassel. <laughs> if anyone yeah. is looking this in vision, she's got a wonderfully rich tassel just uh, over uh, her left ear. Po Polly takes that with her wherever she goes. <laughs> <laughs> sort of My mother tassel. actually used to make tassels, artisanal tassels, as part of her upholstery business. Oh. So I, I know how to make a tassel. It's really complicated <laughs> and slow. Extraordinary to think that somebody used to work for the Lib Dems' mother makes artisanal tassels. It just goes completely against their uh, <laughs> expectations. Uh, very good. Uh, well, it's nice to have you all here. Now, uh, 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 when we, if you want to get in touch, you can email how to win at the times dot uk, WhatsApp o triple three double o three two three five three. Uh, which lots of you did after last week. So we answered lots of your questions last week. So we'll try to get through as lots of those. We've had some correspondence last week. Uh, we, we you, Peter, you said you'd been accosted by a cyclist. Well, we've had this from Harrison. It says, Dear Matt Policy and the Lords, I, I am the Regent's Park cyclist who accosted Peter a few days ago. I can only apologise for startling him. I was equally surprised to see Peter Madison stood there while I was on a bike ride. On my next lap, I thought of much cleverer things to say next time, but sadly disappeared. <laughs> Slash run away in fright. Keep up the podcast, it's great. I can confirm I do not work for Keir Starmer, though I am, a ch I am a pupil barrister based in Kentish Town, so I'll bump into him soon enough and deliver Peter's advice. <laughs> Best wishes, Harrison. So there we are. It's what the Daily Telegraph think happens, which is um, people who work in pupillage in Kentish Town, uh, riding round and round on bicycles round <laughs> Regent's Park, bumping into Peter Mandelson. Yeah. That's the, the conspiracy the, they these have These are in the mind. people they think run the country. Yeah. <laughs> the liberal deep state if only. on a bike. If only, if only. And uh, last week we also had a poem from Rowan. Do you remember the poem? Of course. Well... You'll be pleased to know it's, it, it sparked more poetry. Uh, this is from Rupert. I have a limerick for the podcast. Put three ex-advisors together to find how elections are won. Although one will say nothing works anyway, for politics, it's number one. What do you think of that, Polly? Mm. I loved it. Probably a limerick. <laughs> I want a haiku next, though. Well, if, if, if there's an outlet that could achieve a haiku, it's probably our listeners. So if you want to send us a haiku, uh, email us uh, howtowinatthetimes.co.uk yeah. or WhatsApp. Oh, send us a voice note, 033 I never, I'd never known what a haiku was until I got invited to a bizarre party just before Labour won the 1997 election in which somebody had a Clause 4 party and they had all these kind of Labour questions and one of them was to make up a haiku about Labour and I found myself, I was sort of sitting on a bed together with Liz Simons, Terry Byrne of the Treasury and Sir George Young um, <laughs> and there was also Martin Jakes. I mean, it was the most bizarre party full of these Who kind of the slightly host? outre, I can't, <laughs> that would be unfair to say, but I slightly outre... Um, uh, You've named uh, everyone else. Whose party was it? No. I'm oh, not come on, Danny. Oh, I'm not saying. Oh. It's Theresa May. <laughs> when, <laughs> whenever get Danny gets all coy, the answer is usually <laughs> it was Theresa, Theresa May. No, it wasn't. You weren't perched on Theresa May's bed. So, coming you, up with haikus. How likely do you think it is that Theresa May holds clause four parties involving <laughs> haikus? I don't. I think that's a Polly. Have you ever been to a party a grotesque where you've miscasting? To be honest, where you've come up with haikus? I, I've not been to a haiku party. I, I did once go to a party where. Ed Miliband was there, mm. and I was talking to Allegra Stratton and James Forsyth, uh, who went on to even greater fame in government. Uh, and Ed Miliband, do you know how sometimes when you're at like a, a party and somebody's trying to get into the group and they're like standing at the side <laughs> and they're a bit too shy to interrupt? That was Ed Miliband. And 
it struck me as extraordinary because he was literally the leader of the opposition at the time. <laughs> and and he didn't quite have the courage to like interject to two political journalists. I thought maybe you haven't got the chops to be prime minister. But Peter, mm. Peter's straining at the leash to be fair to Ed Miliband. Yeah, that's <laughs> very unfair, Polly. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Actually, the only bed... I, I have to say that the only bed I've ever bounced up and down on with a famous person <laughs> was Elton John's... What? ...in <laughs> France. And for some reason, Thomas the Tank Engine uh, videos were on, on the TV. The Ringo Starr ones, or the and, later. Uh, this was very early on. And so we... we <laughs> there's a group of us, and we ended up... Not in his bed, but on his bed, yeah. watching these videos, having a great time. With Elton? With Elton. <laughs> That's so much better than Terry Byrne. <laughs> I, I mean, it's I, I, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Danny, but when you start this sort of one-upmanship, you, you know okay. you're going did to be trumped. You, you know you're if, going to be trumped. Points, did, you have to, but did you have to get a clue and then run down to the bottom of the stairs, meet your host there, and shout out the name Peter Hyman uh, to win? <laughs> No, no, it wasn't like that at all. <laughs> I mean, much as I'd just like the no, next... I think that's an equalising goal. 45 minutes to be celebrity beds. I fear we must move on. <laughs> uh, we've had... Uh, oh, we should probably talk about um, Angela Rayner, because uh, this is the story which just sort of won't go away. Uh, this suggestion, critics say she may have underpaid up to £1,500 of capital gains tax when she sold her home in Stockport in 2015. She says it was all above board, she had advice, it was all fine. Uh, the Tories keep on uh, pushing on it. Are there legitimate questions here or is it just a smear campaign? What do you think, Peter? I think there was a legitimate question in the first place, but it's all gone far too far. It's gone, you know, we, we all know why the media are pursuing this and why the chairman of the Conservative Party writes letters about it every day. He wants to turn it and her into a political uh, football. The, the truth is that if you are a Labour and anyone's ever heard of you, if the media can get something on you, they will. I mean, tell me about it. Uh, so I think that, to begin with, it was a perfectly reasonable question, but now what the media are doing are piling in, trying to exert pressure on the police and the tax authorities to go after it and, and turn it into a witch hunt. I think it's pretty tawdry, very unseemly. I think people should now step back and cut us some slack. So I think... Th I, I think... Um there's a time slippage in what you just said about Labour. It's certainly true, once Labour was in office, and you said, tell me about it, the press did go after you and various other people, and these scandals, you know, or such as they were, were built up more than they are, you know, often more than they really were, or indeed when they weren't really scandals at all, as in case of the Hinduja uh, issue. Um, but... That wasn't the case before the 97 election. Before the 97 election, all of that energy was it was put into exposing um, <laughs> MPs who did or did not have a relationship. Let's talk about celebrity yeah. beds, you know, with um, with researchers. Um, and so uh, the truth about this story is it's, first of all, not a huge issue. At the bottom of it, probably concerns whether or not um, she made a mistake in her tax payments, which people do. The whole time, I think. I think she. It looks to me like she probably has. Um, I think she, she's also a bit mishandled it. But it's not involving. A, it's not. Doesn't look to me like it involves, for example, a criminal offence. Um, so uh, it's reasonable for journalists to ask questions. Of course, there's a bit of pressure, but it's not going to be a political issue for Labour because it's Labour and Labour are miles ahead. Rish, Rishi Sunak cannot put on a pair of Samba shoes without that being a more negative story than her. <laughs> no, because that's the narrative. Yeah. And these stories are very much related to the narrative. They, they, they are supportive of the narrative rather than the creating the narrative. That's why I don't think it'll have much effect because it doesn't tell a story people are interested in telling at the moment, right? It, it, the story at the moment is the disintegration of the Tories, the splits in the Tories, the fact that Tories have been in power too long. Any story that, that adds to that is a much bigger story Has than this. one about Angela Rayner when the story on Labour is they're all coming into power and they're fresh. So with her, it's bound to end with all the Tories' energy in um, she made a small mistake. But she's not handling it well. The example you, you, you I think I might have talked about this before, but like Ed Miliband's bacon sandwich, that just spoke to all the problems around Ed Miliband. Yeah, it was like... Around the same time, David Cameron ate a hot dog with a knife and fork, which frankly is weirder. But because he was sort of riding high, and, you know, it, 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 it didn't get ingrained in people's mind at the same time. What do you think, Polly? I think the, the other thing about Angela Rayner is she's really normal. And 
lots of this story in which she may have made an error in her tax payment remind you that she's quite normal. She's got a blended family and things are a bit complicated and she bought a house for, what, £79,000, sort of normal amount of money that people uh, it, it can relate to. Whereas when there was a scandal about Nadim Zahawi having made a settlement with HMRC over what was described as carelessness um, in his tax affairs, he, he paid, uh, by all accounts, a seven-figure settlement with HMRC and was not prosecuted. But those kinds of conversations and the conversations about, you know, Rishi Sunak's wealth or Rishi Sunak's gadget purchasing uh, help to remind you that the Conservatives uh, operate in a, a completely different mm. set of financial mm. circumstances. And so for all of this incredible complexity, I think a lot of what you're left with is, uh, yeah, maybe Angela Rayner made a mistake, but Angela Rayner's quite normal, which I, I think probably net helps them rather than anything else. We don't know whether Angela Rayner made a mistake and none of us can judge, none of us no. uh, know the facts. And yet here everyone is standing in judgment over her and turning, into a, uh, turning her into a, 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 a victim. Um, uh, just because it's a good, good, clean political uh, fun. But the point I think is that this is obviously a very grey area. I mean, when when you have separated or divorced and you've got kids and they're going from one home to another, I mean, you know, look, this must this must arise in so many people's cases. It's up to the tax authorities to decide, right. not for others to stand in judgment over it is, her. It is generally my position not to stand in judgment on other people unless I absolutely have to, and I, and I certainly don't stand in judgment on her. It, 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 it's not a, it's not a big issue. Uh, she certainly mishandled it, and probably it was a mistake. Um, but at the end of the day, people don't want to know about this because it's because uh, it's labour. So it's the opposite of what you're saying, which is people are making more of a fuss than it warrants. Actually, actually the story hasn't been big. It won't be big, at it's least for another reason. It's today. Which the is BBC is still the asking questions about but the, but it stories this being, morning. OK, so I, I realise this <laughs> is a this bit of a countercultural thing to say. Stories being in newspapers don't make them big issues, right? <laughs> because yeah. but, most, but this, they're this big involved... issues, Danny, when the BBC take them okay. up and ask the Shadow Chancellor for the umpteenth so time on the Today the first, programme well, it, No, about not it. even then, right? So the first thing that's important... Nothing is makes that... a difference to no, Danny. No, 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 but it doesn't... Know. Where's the bell? Obviously, Where's the bell? Obviously, <laughs> we're talking about... that, no, but I do... I, I mean, uh, this, is, that, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is a classic example of this, right? Um, uh, lots of people don't know who she is. That's the first point. Or if they do know who she is, they only vaguely understand where she sits, right? L many, many, many people are utterly unaware of this story altogether. They simply don't know at all about this. Then lots of people, and that includes me who's read a lot of it, can't really form a view. It's all a bit complicated. It involves you having to know how capital gains tax is taxed, right? And then forming a view about it. So at multiple levels, this is highly, highly unlikely to be damaging. The only thing about it is if she tells a straightforward lie, just as Labour, which I don't think at the moment is the issue that's been debated but were it to be the case that she had told a straightforward lie about something that then came out just as Labour was releasing a tax avoidance policy to crack down on tax avoidance you could just about imagine a, a, a circumstance in which it might matter to her but even by the way if she had to resign in a massive scandal that wouldn't change the election result yeah. right um so uh, I this is an I know that people joke about me saying these things, but what I'm trying to do... Is there is anything this, that would make a difference? Of course, there are a lot... I mean, <laughs> just, bit, just to, to make sure that's clear, there are lots of things that do make a big difference. And the, and there's an element in Angela Rayner which would be important, which is if it was the case that Keir Starmer were to publicly mishandle a big issue in a big way, that could make a difference because mm. Keir Starmer's rating makes a difference. But... But I'm, what I'm trying to do is not say nothing makes a difference. I'm trying to distinguish between signal and noise. And while this I, is classic political noise. And, and actually, given that the you know the whole purpose of having the three of you here, so that you can you can point out the stuff that matters and the stuff that doesn't. Um, when we uh, did the the polling the other week, which revealed that uh, Fiona Wilson, the Labour front bench of Fiona Wilson, uh, was was more popular than, than um, several of her colleagues who actually exist. Fiona Wilson doesn't exist. She we made her up, and she had uh, quite good poll waiters. Uh, but um, uh, Angela Rayner, eighty percent of people said they knew who uh, Angela Rayner was. 
Uh, and there was split sort of down the middle, favourable and unfavourable. So we actually she polled quite well compared to some. That's very but that's high. even that's, 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 that's very that, high. That Assu- but then remember, f- f- half of people claim to have heard this, of Fiona Wilson. So the fact they've heard of her doesn't mean <laughs> yeah. they know who she yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. But she different. does evoke strong emotions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, like her or loather, uh, she is a great personality. Uh, she's very punchy as. I discovered only the other week, um, and uh, you know, and, oh, and, and I see actually, why being so well behaved. Now. And actually, yeah, people so quite like a yeah. lively, punchy, different sort of politician. What they don't like is witch hunts, yeah. and I think this is likely to end up uh, in her gaining more sympathy uh, than losing. I think it. the that public love right. witch hunts. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not get bogged down in witches and which witches bed you've bounced on. Um, Ken has just pointed that's out the, that's why the metaphor. Was Daddy, bent. you were just making the point that word Labour announced a crackdown on tax avoiders, but it is literally on the front of the mirror today. We'll pu- punish tax avoiders, uh, tax dodgers, which is, exactly. if nothing else, is is amusing. Let's turn our attention now to this question from Ryan. I'd love it if you guys could cast your minds back to 2010 with the uh, what felt like at the time inaugural election debates um, in the US style. Um, can you recall any preparation um, and, and how we approached those debates at the very time? Um, hashtag I agree with Nick. But in fact, uh, just to jog your memories, we can rewind the clock. It was this very week in 2010, the first TV debate took place on ITV. Let's take a listen. We'll be hearing from three men, each hoping to be the leader of the next UK government in the first election debate. Let me take on very directly this question of of money and public spending, because I think it's going to be a common feature right through these debates. Will you continue to fund the police? Yes, of course. But, but Gordon, but let me give you an you, example. Will you match let me give our you, funding on the police? The answer the is no from let, your manifesto. Let me give you Can a you very good example. This is, it, not, this is not question time. Let Mr Cameron answer your answer, point, Mr Brown. It's answer Cameron, time, David. I'm just slightly surprised that there's any discussion between you two going on about what, what money you can put into public services. Because I read your manifestos this week. In neither of them are you coming clean with people about how anything costs. Because you can't airbrush your policies, even although you can airbrush your posters. Because he's given this country the biggest budget deficit of any development developed country in the world. Thank you, Mr Brown. Mr Clegg. I'm not sure if you're like me, but the more they attack each other, the more they sound exactly (laughs) the same. I would love to take everyone out of their first £10,000 of income tax, Nick. It's a beautiful idea. It's a lovely idea. We cannot afford it. Where people feel it's complete chaos. You see, I agree with uh, Nick. An an arbitrary national cap will not work. At the end of an historic moment in television and political history, a very good night to you. So that was that very first debate in 2010. Uh, Peter, you were uh, business secretary. Well, we won't list all of your, your job titles, though, because we, we won't have time. But you More were... importantly, I, I was chairing the campaign. You were chairing the campaign <laughs> and you were, you, were, you were advising Gordon Brown. Why was it that debates, TV debates, which have been talked about an awful lot, why was it that they happened in 2010? Was it because Gordon Brown agreed to do it? They happened because both David Cameron and Gordon Brown thought they could emerge successfully from them. Uh, Gordon Brown, because he was way behind and thought this was an opportunity to catch up, and David uh, Cameron, because he thought he would be very sort of, you know, fleet of foot and very charming and fresh-faced and, you know, would tap dance his way through to success. So there was an incentive, a reason for both of them to agree. Having said that, Gordon Brown, in the first instance, had not wanted to, uh, this debate and was quite irritated with me when months before the election, I had said in an interview to the Evening Standard that I thought they were a good idea, that their time had come, that uh, Gordon would do very well. And I returned to number 10 as he was just perusing the evening standard said what on earth are you doing here i've never decided that i wanted to do an election debate i said gordon it's going to happen don't look for it and anyway you're going to come out of it very well and my chief memory of that first uh, debate was racing off to the spin room before the debate actually ended so that i could get my verdict in first i got down there and i said in my view uh, nick clegg has won the debate on style. Gordon Brown has won the debate on substance. And that leaves David Cameron, who, in comparison to these two titans, I said, (laughs) uh, altogether look rather shallow. Uh, I said, so he's the loser. And that was my aim, to make Cameron into the loser, uh, to pump up uh, Gordon, 
in the debate, but also to trigger a little bit of Clegg mania uh, because I thought that building up the Liberal Democrats uh, would lead to them siphoning off Tory votes. I wanted to divide the non-Labour votes between the Tories and Liberals, so I uh, built up uh, Nick uh, at the end of that debate and I had a very tough phone call, I remember, uh, the next day from uh, T. Blair who said, I think this is a rather dangerous tactic on your part. I can see what you're doing, talking up uh, Nick Clegg, but just be careful what you wish for. I said, if they do that well, they'll be taking Labour votes as well. And I said, I'll take the risk, thank you. So that's a few from the Labour side. From David Cameron's point of view, yeah. it didn't really work for him, did it, that first one? No. Despite having been quite a relaxed, assured performer in other settings, he came across, watching it back, yeah. quite sort of... So he, was a robot made of ham, was how yeah, Captain Moran described he rang, it. He rang me afterwards and said... Um, for the he'd been standing at this debate, uh, and just as it began, for the first time in his political life that he could remember, and he said this to me, I I, I suddenly saw the sort of weight of political responsibility, and I was nervous for the which I never am, uh, and um, I, I realised I thought of all the people uh, you know like you that I who whom I was speaking for, and all the people who are working on the campaign, and the burden of sort of being their voice really got to me, and I then didn't feel I performed particularly well. Um, I had actually been against them holding the uh, debate on the grounds that um, I, I felt they, David Cameron was ahead. I didn't think Gordon Brown could catch up and I couldn't see any advantage. Uh, on, the, on debates, um, the evidence of the political scientist James Stimson is um, that, uh, that, that, there's, that there's mixed um, academic evidence of their influence. Um, but, but almost certainly the influence is small, uh, much less than conventions in America, for uh, which he uses. So, for example, there's a very famous uh, instance where John F. Kennedy is supposed to have done better on television and Richard Nixon had done better on radio. But it turned out that was a purely statistical effect. Richard Nixon uh, was only on radio in rural areas who didn't have television, and the rural people all vote Republican. And what that's telling you is that people watch these debates and they see the thing that they already like and they like them more. Now, that, that doesn't account, of course, for... Or Nick Clegg. Um, George Osborne was doing the debate with um, with Vince Cable and, and he Darling. and he did and Alistair Darling and he did a trial before it and he rang me and said um, Vince Cable will win this debate. I could I there's no way of countering the coming through the middle when there are three people. Um, he said we tried everything that we could to do it and there's nothing that will work and indeed that's yeah. exactly what happens. So so. It wasn't a good idea to hold the debate. Um, it probably did produce an unhelpful fluctuation, Anna, in, in, for, for the Tories. Um, I don't think it fundamentally affected the election result all that much, and I wouldn't expect it to. Um, most of the people who are watching the debate have already made up their mind. It simply reinforces them. If it produces a polling effect, most of it is uh, enhanced probability of voting of people uh, who, who um, were watching the debate. Uh, probably the, the counter-argument to that is if the debates hadn't happened in 2010, Nick Clegg would have been squeezed out. It becomes a two-horse race between Cameron and, and Brown. And that actually what what the, the effect of Clegg mania meant that he, he shot up and then came down again, and that's actually why you ended up where you were. If... Oh, sorry, just being a poly, yeah. I'm sorry, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean... It, it, it's impossible to know, isn't it? I mean, it, there's, no, there's no perfect... Ex oh, she faded away. Just faded away, just wistfully, wistfully recalling, uh, wistfully recalling the, the, Nick Clegg. So this is the point you made is true if you think that the election campaigns massively change results. Most of the time, the election result is pretty much similar at the end of the campaign as it was at the beginning of the campaign. That that is with twenty seventeen being an important exception and that's important in the case of Nick Clegg because what happened in 2017 was the bringing together of the left vote so um, actually I, I think I would have been mm. with Tony but I would have been nervous about what you were doing because I think it there was a danger that it split the left vote more and helped the Tories in that way um, rather than producing a, a, an anti-Cameron effect but but I, you know these are all imponderables and and at the end of the day um, no I'm definitely arguing 
if you and with the evidence before me that at the beginning of the campaign and at the end of the campaign Nick Clegg was in the same position and this is also true of almost every presidential candidate before and after the debates including John F Kennedy who definitely did worse after these famous debates in which he's supposed to which are supposed to have clinched the presidency for him actually his poll rating was lower after them I think it's a great shame that oh, wait, I think we've got Polly back got Polly, Polly back be there I don't know where I got to. Was I? Was I... <laughs> you, let's assume we didn't hear very much. So, what right. you, you're, you're, you you were basically saying there's no way of knowing, but and then you sort of drifted away. Well, there's there's no way of knowing what would have happened if the debates hadn't happened. We had the structural advantage that Danny describes George Osborne identifying that you can kind of come through the middle, um, and and you can dismiss the other two, and you can surprise people. Because mostly before the debates, we just had that sense of low expectations. You know, people would people would just ask Nick, why has nobody heard of you? Uh, what's the point of the Liberal Democrats? And, and so from a low expectation base, we were able to genuinely surprise people. And Nick has a, a freshness and a humanity that he was able to bring to that, which, which just um, I, I certainly felt like it transformed the Liberal Democrat campaign and our impact and certainly our visibility, what would have happened without them? I, I, I do believe that what would have happened is what happened, uh, perhaps not as dramatically as in 2015, but when it's going to be a close election, the inexorable demands of a first-past-the-post system are just make your mind up. Make your mind up between the two big parties. And without that megaphone platform of being able to say there is an alternative of three big debates, I, it, it just doesn't seem to me that Nick Clegg would have had any chance of holding on to as many seats as we did. But there were two sort of two negative results of all of that publicity and all of that bandwidth. The first is we got overconfident and actually expanded the range of seats we were targeting, yeah, which yeah, was reckless. And uh, we unleashed a wall of vitriol and contempt and uh, and a sort of rage and, you know, Nick Clegg being accused of being a Nazi a sympathiser and uh, all of that stuff, accused of financial irregularities, which were just made up and, you know, consuming huge amounts of campaign capacity. It is amazing, actually, when you look back at the poll, after that first debate, there were three polls which put the Lib Dems in first place. Uh, and then uh, with two, one or two, three points ahead of the Tories and then Labour pushed into third. So it was an extraordinary moment. So what that shows is that voting behaviour and polling can be very noisy. And the, the one case, you know, against my general thesis about, you know, fundamentals and ma mattering and noise doesn't matter is the election result um, to, uh, could be in the middle of a period of noise, right? It was quite late on. It could happen in the middle of a period of noise. And I, I used to have this argument with the editor of the Times, the previous editor, John Witherow, which he used to treat me with like I was mad. But I, I used to say to him, election results are not actually perfect measures of of public opinion, and let alone opinion <laughs> polls, because there's so because because opinion fluctuates and and measurements fluctuate. So I I I think you got that fluctuation in the middle of the campaign. It was a bit destabilising, but it just the campaign lasted just long enough for noise for for signal to reassert itself. Just to go back to what Danny was saying about you know election campaigns not really determining the result, the outcome, and fast forward to the present day. I rather fear for the election campaign we're looking forward to uh, now because I think it's going to be a bear garden. I think you've got so many, many more broadcasters, media outlets, proliferation thereof, all jockeying uh, uh, for position. I don't think the broadcasters uh, are going to find it at all easy to come together and make a straight, straight proposition of, of uh, two or three debates to be had. Uh, I think you've got a proliferation of political parties as well because, you know, look, people should really be able to choose between who between two individuals who are likely to become prime minister. You can't because you've got the SNP, you've got Plaid, you've now got Reform, you've got them all piling in. And I think the whole thing is going to be very dumbed down. That would be my, uh, be my fear. And what would just, be to, your... just to make, take Janice's point, 
it's the interest of the political parties for the campaigns not to make any difference. <laughs> you know, they, they want to keep well, everything, everything battened down, no risk, don't say anything or do anything that might suddenly create some gotcha moment uh, for the media to p- pile in. Say as little as you can, get through to polling day uh, intact and hope people have the same view at the end that they did at the beginning. And that's going to make a disastrous election uh, campaign. It's going to be very unstimulating. Uh, there are going to be no proper uh, debates if if this course is the one that uh, I'm describing we're set, we're, we are embarked on. Why would you uh, want a stimulating campaign piece? I mean, Labour's 20% Because people ahead. are entitled to have proper debates so about you, pop- you... competing individuals and competing policies and take a v- an well, informed view with some facts put oh, into the equation oh, about what the future of the I, country is going I to be. I didn't realise you were suddenly doing that. Uh, obviously. <laughs> I, uh, obviously um, I sorry? No, 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 no. I, I'm sorry. I, this, somebody's replaced the Peter Mandelson I knew with, some, with a cyborg. Some imposter. I, I completely agree that from a public um, policy point of view and from a... And from a, a sort of, you know, journalistic point of view, I and mean, after all, what the Times tries to do every day is elicit what the truth is about politics, and I try and do that in my columns yeah. as well. And indeed, that's what we're trying to do here. Um, so, of course, we want stimulating yeah. debate, but if you're a political what? strategist, right, I yeah. mean, if you, well, if you are Keir Starmer's political strategist, okay. that's the yeah, last so thing. I, I, I'm fact, talking what, 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 as an ex-political strategist who no doubt played his part in designing campaigns. No, no <laughs> With risk. With a capital N. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, all, all I'm saying now, however, is that as I an think impartial people... Bystander, I think as yeah. an impartial bystander, yeah. I think the general public are absolutely fed to the back teeth with seeing the sort of jeering and jousting, the sort of PMQs on stilts put on television. I think it will turn them off in droves. I don't think you'll reach the end of the campaign and anyone will be any the wiser about what the real challenges and problems are facing our country and what the competing approaches are to resolving them and facing up to them. Well, so what I want to so do... I think, Sorry, go on, Polly. But Peter's completely right. And it's this way in which democracy, for all of its strengths, just sort of steadily eats itself. Um, we it, it opens up space for populism. It opens up space for someone like Donald Trump, who uh, is willing to cause offence and and somehow the causing of offence is proof of authenticity. And we saw some of that sort of technique with Boris Johnson is because people are so exhausted by the lack of substance and seriousness, which is driven by political strategists. And the problem is they're kind of right. It, it's the choice between what people sort of say they want uh, and what they want in uh, kind of uh, in the long term, and and what they respond to in the short term, yeah, I mean, uh, which, which which tends to be just nebulous noise, and it just destroys our ability to have proper conversations. Well, to what I want to do in a minute, I want to ask you if you, what your advice would be to the party leaders and whether or not they should take part in the debates. Right, we've done a bit of the history. Let's look ahead. What would be your advice to? Keir Starmer, should he bother doing them? Is there an advantage for for Rishi Sunak? Would Ed Dave even get the three-way vote now, the three-way debate, Polly? I think, the I mean, the answer is obviously no. And what we've seen in previous, more recent elections is terrible television um, <laughs> of, I don't know, dozens of people from every party. And, and you know, and, and a difficult situation where you've got sort of Plaid Cymru trying to give an opinion about the whole of... UK politics and policy when actually they're, you know, quite rightly only really care about Wales. And all of it, it's terrible, doesn't kind of give any insight. And I, I mean, I don't think the broadcasters should put it on, but they, they probably will. I think that a format that can work quite well um, is is where you have the, the sort of the more intensive interview. Uh, I think in 2017, Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn did a uh, d- did a sort of intensive sort of interview with a studio audience in sequence rather than as a head-to-head debate. I thought that actually drew out quite a lot of substance in a useful way. 
What about you, Danny? What would you so, advise Rishi Sunak? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start with Keir Starmer. Don't, under any circumstances, allow the debate. If you absolutely have to, insist that Richard Tice is there. That probably will stop the debate, but if it did, it would create a real problem for, for Rishi Sunak. If you're Rishi Sunak, yes, ask for a debate every day. You never know uh, whether an election uh, result may coincide with the noise that's created. It probably won't change anything, but it might. If you do, oddly, I think there is a case, and I'd like to look at the data a bit more before being certain about this, that unusually uh, it might be better if you did a debate to aim at your base um, rather than aiming at uh, flipping voters, because you probably won't flip voters, but you might enthuse your own support and get more of it to turn out. Um, but I, I, as I say, you need to need to do a solid bit of work to make sure that that instinct was right, because normally my instinct is go for for, for middle voters and, and try and convert. Um, but uh, Ed Davey, I don't think, will be involved in this uh, equation, so I wouldn't know what advice to give him. Obviously, my advice to him would be, please, um, obviously, he should desperately want to debate, um, but he won't be involved in it. <laughs> Peter, what would be your advice to Keir? My, my advice to Keir is... Apart from lose weight, obviously. Is, uh, ..is the opposite of Danny's. My advice to Keir Starmer is to be a statesman. Uh, have the debate, uh, organise it as far as you can, just with uh, Rishi Sunak, not with Richard Tice, who will just be a sort of disruptor in the whole thing, and try and turn the thing into a proper debate, debate, uh, you know, people presenting, you know, not just taking lumps out of each other, not just offering sound bites, not just sort of, you know, coming in with the sort of cracks but, and you know, try and have a proper debate. Well, and the reason, the you? reason, <laughs> the reason I say that is because I also think Keir Starmer should not be appealing just to his base. I think he should be appealing uh, to voters who have not yet made up their mind, uh, who could go either. Uh, way uh, uh, because they've got to be persuaded that he's a serious guy for serious times with serious worked out missions and policies that he knows what he's doing he's going to roll up his sleeves and get cracking the moment yeah, he's yeah. there and understand. that is the sort of impact that I'd, I would I'd like to see uh, uh, come out of a debate I'd obviously say all that while passing him a piece of paper saying don't under any circumstances do it, um, <laughs> it that, those sound, that sound, no but that sounds that you sounds know, fantastic and obviously everyone who listens to it thinks you know I can't believe Danny Wilson doesn't want to do it I'm just thinking in political heart Hard-headed terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Tice no. thing is People a have just okay. discovered that Danny is a very cynical individual, no, whereas Peter Mandelson now has. To answer the question. He, he, he's end, turned into a statesman end, of our time. I want to end on a haiku, uh, as they say. Um, well, we've had several haikus in. Joe says, Mandelson's whispers, Finkelstein's Tory foresight shines, Mackenzie's insights gleam. And Helen says, uh, you on Elton John's bed. That was how to win an election. <laughs> with Peter Manson, Danny Finkstein and Polly McKenzie.